Thank you so much for streaming our latest message from First Baptist Church. Here at FBC, our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We do that by thinking big, thinking small, thinking in, and thinking out. We hope that this message helps you as you continue to grow in your faith. If you would like to stay connected to FBC, you can visit our website at fbcloyd.ca, look us up on Facebook and Instagram, or download our free mobile app. Now here's the latest from FBC. Enjoy. Hey guys, I'm so excited to be here this morning, and I hope you are too. Uh, what an awesome morning it is already. We got to listen to our awesome band and sing along with them. Uh, Megan just killed it. That was awesome. I know a lot of people don't love the idea of getting up on a stage in front of hundreds of people, so give her a high five when you see her. Um, and, and also, this room is packed with awesome people that we get to hang out with, and that, that's, a, that's a really cool thing. It's easy to take that for granted, but we get to all hang out this morning. Now, the bad news on the tail end of all of that is that for the rest of your time here for the service this morning, you have to listen to me, okay? So, sorry about that. Not listening to Doug because he's gonna be sitting over there trying to figure out how to use the app while I'm up here speaking. Um, I hope you guys were here last week for our Turn It Up kickoff. Doug did an awesome job. Uh, if you missed it, if you miss any Sunday, we say this a lot, you can catch up on our YouTube channel, on our app, our podcast, uh, our website, whatever. You can always check it out. Um, but he did an awesome job. And I'm actually going to pick up right where Doug left off last week. Doug left off with what he said was the theme verse for our series. And this is kind of the verse that we want to kind of theme this whole idea of turning it up around. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2.9, and he says, However, as it is written, and, and I'll stop there for a second, because if you're like me, you read that, and you're like, it's written where? So this is Paul referencing uh, a book in the Old Testament, a prophet named Isaiah, and it comes from Isaiah 64, so you can read it there as well. But Paul says, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. So uh, I'll say it again, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for who? For those who love him. In our culture, in our world, there are a lot of things that we refer to as like unbelievable or unfathomable. It's like you wouldn't believe this, you know, like you eat at like the best restaurant you've ever eaten at, you see the funniest movie you've ever seen, or you see someone do something crazy and you're just like, it's unbelievable. You'll tell someone about this, like, you wouldn't believe how good this is. But a common theme with all of those things is that when it comes down to it, they are actually believable. It's not unbelievable. We, uh, you know, you could come up to me and say, Ryan, you know, uh, you wouldn't believe it. It's unbelievable. This kid got up at, at his talent show at school in front of hundreds of people and took a bottle with just a little bit of water in it, landed a perfect bottle flip, and the whole place went nuts. I'd be like, actually, I, that is believable because I've seen it. I've seen it on the internet, you know? I don't know if you guys watch those People Are Awesome videos on YouTube. I love those, mostly because it's just like clips of me over and over again. Um, but I love those. Like, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen this one, but like the guy who can like fold the pizza box in like a second flat, he just like knit, slaps it down and he just keeps doing that. Or people can chop vegetables really, like, it's weird. I, I love these videos. And those are the types of things that you would look at and be like, that's unbelievable. But when it comes down to it, uh, I can believe it because I've seen it. I've experienced it. I can eat that like, unbelievable food or see that unbelievable movie. Um, I love like, crazy rides at amusement parks. There's not a roller coaster for me that's crazy and scary enough. Like, the, the crazier, 
the better. I like to be on the brink of death the whole time, and then I can say that was a really good ride. Growing up, I'd always go to the Calgary Stampede every summer, and they don't have like crazy roller coasters at fairs, but my favorite ride was this ride called the Zipper. Maybe you know it. And yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of as crazy as it gets at the fair, so I really liked it. But my friend Dana and I, what we figured out was the ride itself is awesome, but while you're in that time where they're loading cars and you're basically just sitting still or unloading at the end, what you can do is you can start rocking the car back and forth, you can start pumping it back and forth, and eventually you get enough momentum that all of a sudden you hit that front flip. And then the cool thing is, if you kind of pump again on your way down, you hit another front flip, and you can start just doing consecutive front flips. And soon, the favorite part of our ride was just like when we were sitting still there, because like we can just keep flipping. So one time we went on and we, we hit like a bunch of front flips in a row, and we're like, you know what? We got off, we're like, we can do better than that. So we got on the ride, and we were the last ones on, so the ride started right away. So we went through the ride, which was awesome. And at the end, uh, we were like, okay, we're going to be the last ones off. So we start going. And something happened. So we got like an extra minute or two where someone was having trouble getting off. Or I don't know. So anyways, we had this extra minute or two. And I kid you not, my friend Dana and I did 192 consecutive front flips on the zipper. <laughs> I, and the, like, honestly, the only way, like, after a few, the only way you can count is because you can feel the splash of the blood hitting your brain and then your heart, like, back and forth. My, my, I was wearing shorts, and the backs of my calves were bleeding from chafing on the seat because it was just, like, so much. We, we got off at, at the bottom. When they opened the door, I got off, and I just ate it into the fence. Like, I was just, like, done. <laughs> people maybe thought I was drunk on the ride. And I remember the lineup, was, there were a few people who were just, like, that was crazy, and I was like, I know it. Like, and I was like, man, I wish the iPhone was invented so someone could have videoed that or something. But, uh, you know, but we walked away from it, and we were like, we can't tell anyone about that because, like, <laughs> no one's gonna believe us. That, like, if someone told me they did that, I'd be like, that's a lie. And so you guys are like some of the first people I've ever told that because I've always just been ashamed that people are gonna be like, you're a liar. And so I decided in front of hundreds of people would be the moment when I would maybe like see if people think I'm a liar. But, but I promise you, it was true. I wish I still had the scars on the back of my calves. The cool thing about this passage, 1 Corinthians 2.9, it says, what no eye has seen. It's not saying some people have seen this. Some people have like, you caught a glimpse of this. It's saying, no, no eye has seen this. What no ear has heard. Not like, you know, there's this remote tribe over here. They've heard about it. Most people haven't heard about it. No, no, no. What no ear has heard. What no human mind has conceived. Not like, oh, the brightest and the smartest, they've thought of this. This passage is saying, no one has conceived. The, the biggest, best thing you can think of pales in comparison to what? To what God has promised to those who love him. Now, if you've been at FPC for a while, you know that we believe that the Bible is foundational truth for all that we do. We believe that God has spoken to us and he's revealed his words in the Bible. And when we read something in there, we can take it to the bank. We can stand on that. We can base our lives on what we read there. And maybe you're new here and you're like, well, I don't know about that yet. And, you know, we want to invite you to just continue to experience what we're doing here at FBC. Hear about faith. It's amazing. It's, it's difficult. But God's promised big things to those who love him. And my question for you this morning is if you claim to take God at his word, if you claim to believe in the Bible, do you actually take him out of his word? Not in a way where you just say, yeah, I agree, or I believe that stuff, but in a way where your life reflects the truth of this statement in the Bible. This is just one small first, but does your life say that I take God at his word, that he has things beyond my wildest imagination, beyond what anybody could ever understand if I am committed to following him and love him? We, we decided to do this series, I'm guessing probably over a year ago. I mean, we, we get together and we plan as far out as we can. And so, but whenever I think about this series and even this verse, um, there's this movie that I often think of. Now, quick disclaimer, I, I haven't always been a Christian and my standards of what I watch have changed a lot. I watched this movie a long time ago and just out of curiosity, last week I went on IMDb's Parent Guide and, and I'm not recommending this movie because there is actually a fair amount of language in it. So, but that was like in my old life. So now I'm allowed to reference it, but just be you know, free of the guilt of talking about it this morning because I'm safe now, okay? So, but don't watch this movie. But it reminds me of this movie called Spinal Tap. And maybe some of you have seen it. I don't, I don't think it was even that big of a movie when I was young. But what Spinal Tap is, is it's this mockumentary on this like, made-up, fictitious British rock band called Spinal Tap. And they go around and they find stuff out about this band. And in, in the movie, these, these guys in this band are like total like, over-the-top moron goofball guys, which 
uh, just for the record, is what I've heard is not what most guys in rock bands are like. But uh, this, there's this one scene, and it's really the only scene I remember, but it's iconic. My friends and I used to always reference this. And what's happening is one of the guys from the band is he's showing one of the documentary people, he's showing them the guitar amps. He's showing them, he's like, look at all these knobs. He's like, all of them, they go up to 11. And he's like, so we can turn it up to 11. He's like, you know, a lot of other, and he's saying in this really cool British accent, but like, I just can't, so I, I don't want to embarrass myself and make you feel uncomfortable by doing that this morning. But he's telling him, he's like, most people in bands are up there, they've got it at 10, and you know, they're rocking out, and they just want a little bit more, but where do they go? And he's like, nowhere. They got nowhere to go. He's like, but us, we're at 10, we need that extra push, we go to 11. And the guy in the documentary is like, well, why don't you just make 10 louder, and then it could still go to 10, to which the guy like blankly stares at him and goes, these go to 11. And so anyways, I, I, I can't help but thinking about this idea of these guys turning up to 11. And the cool thing is, is that, you know, when you think about turning it up to 11, that doesn't actually exist. That doesn't actually change anything. You can't make something louder than it can be. Or, or you hear about like a coach saying, hey guys, get out there and give it 110%. Or someone saying, I'm 1,000% sure. That's not actually real. That's not actually, within our human context, something that exists. We're limited to 100%. But with God, he's got this setting that this passage is saying. It's like it's beyond what the world has to offer you. It's beyond what you could imagine or hear of or see or think of or anything. It's this 11. It is this next level beyond anything you could ever imagine if you love him. Last week, Doug was talking about one of our four thinks, think in. And he's talking about the essential of engaging and, and beyond that, engaging with God, engaging personally with God, which as a staff, we kind of sat around and talked about. And we're like, you know, this is really what it all comes down to. This is the fundamental, foundational kind of piece to what we are as a church. Our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we just want people to engage personally with God. And if they do that, we believe that the other things will naturally follow. But we also think that the other things invest into the think-in component. And so what we're going to be doing for the following three weeks of the series is just looking at the other three thinks through the lens of thinking in and how it interacts with, if you're thinking in, how you should think big and small and out, and if you're doing those, how it invests into you thinking in, into you engaging personally with God. If this think it language is confusing because you're new here or you usually sleep when Doug and I are talking, uh, then you stick around for a couple weeks and you'll find out a little bit more about this. Matthew 22, 37 uh, Jesus is asked what the greatest reply, commandment is, and Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Jesus says this is the greatest commandment. This is what we base our think-in component on, to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says that if you love God, he's prepared mind-blowing, unfathomable, actually unbelievable things for you? Do you take him at his word? This type of language, to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, it doesn't sound like a passive, like, sit back on the couch and be like, yeah, God's a good guy. I totally, like, think he's real. I show up to church every once in a while. I kind of do these things, whatever. Donate, stuff like that. This is an all-encompassing, every ounce of your being, every fiber of who you are type love. Jesus is saying, the greatest commandment is to commit all of who you are to love me, but he says in return, I, I will offer you something beyond what you could ever think of or imagine. This series is all about turning up the significance, the purpose, and the meaning in your life, and we believe that every single person in this room, ourselves included, has the opportunity with God to take him at his word and experience what it means to turn up the significance in your life, and we think that thinking big is such a vital part of this. Maybe you're new here this morning, maybe it's your millionth time here. If you're new here, I should invite you to hear about the amazing faith experience that you can have in the Bible and give you a glimpse into what this is all about. If you've been here a million times, like Megan said, maybe you're already like, I already think big. I'm already here. It's Sunday morning, right? Like, but what we believe is we believe that there's always room for growth in your growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't want to be people who just sit back and are complacent and content with where we're at, but understand that the best is yet to come and that God delivers on his promises. Our, the God that you read about in the Bible is a very relational God. The Bible is just this giant narrative about that. I mean, God creates humans out of love, and he wants relationship with them. And then the rest of the Bible is just a story about how we continue to mess that up and break that, and he pursues us 
with total faithful love and compassion and grace and says, I want to restore and rebuild relationship with you. I want to grow in relationship with you. There's this uh, monk that lived in the 5th and 6th century, and his name's St. Benedict. And as far as monks go, he's probably one of the most famous ones that's ever lived. I mean, that's like not probably saying much to a lot of people because like compared to what other monks, but um, anyways, this guy, St. Benedict, he decided he wanted to devote his whole life to the pursuit of God. So he decided to start weeding out distractions in his life. And so what he actually did, pretty extreme, he decided to go live as a hermit in a cave in a mountain in Italy. And so much so that shepherds would like let food down on a rope to him. Like he isolated himself so that human interaction and nothing would interfere with his relationship with God, his pursuit of God. And one of the most important things that he learned through these three years in this cave was that faith is best experienced and most effectively experienced in community and in relationship. So he crawled out of the cave, started some monasteries all over the world, impacted the world on a pretty global scale, and started creating faith communities for people to experience faith in community. I'm really thankful that we have this example so I don't have to go live in a cave for three years to figure that out. Life is all about thinking in and engaging personally with God. But we don't believe here at FBC that you do that in a vacuum. We don't believe that you do that in isolation. We don't think anyone is an island. We believe that God has created an amazing community here for you to experience faith. And now there's some fill in the blanks if you've got the app notes open or your bulletin or whatever. You can fill those out. But I encourage you also jot down some of the scripture passages as hopefully those will be mostly what you'll reflect on when you uh, look at this later. Uh, There are a few things that I think the church is, a few ways I would sum it up. I mean, I think a lot more could be said, but I think about three kind of things when I think about what the church is. First of all, the church is a family. You know, you have a family, you're born into a family, and much to like a lot of our, maybe some people's dismay, you don't get to choose which family you're born into. You're just stuck with those people for the rest of your life, right? But it's a beautiful thing because there's this bond, this deep connection, this instant community and relationship that you're born into, and it's a beautiful thing. And you share so much with them. You love each other and you experience relationship in that. Life is not easy, all the time. Faith isn't easy all the time. So you go through the difficult times and the good times together with family. And it's like that with the church. Uh, The church is a prototype. So I don't know if any of you guys this past week have seen the cool new trailers for the iPhone 10 coming out. Um, My, uh, you can like, I don't know if you've seen it. There's no button. You unlock it with your face. And I don't mean like you put your face on the phone. You just look at your phone and it recognizes your face and it unlocks the phone. It's crazy. So my wife, Talisi, earlier this week learned a very, very valuable life lesson. And that is, is that you're not supposed to put your iPhone in the washing machine. Um, which she could have just asked me because I'm like a, you know, a fountain of wisdom in that regard, but she decided to test it out, I guess. And so her phone works like at zero capacity. But I will tell you that it has never been cleaner and it has never smelled as fresh as it currently smells after having gone through the washing machine, but it, it doesn't do anything. The next day, she's on her computer and this ad for the iPhone 10 comes on and she's like, how did they know I broke my phone? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know who they are. They just always know, you know? And so they're showing her this ad, and she's like, oh my goodness, like, you know, no button, the screen's bigger and stuff like that. Um, what happens with technology and cars and stuff like that is, is there's always this prototype, you know, this glimpse into the future. No one here can buy an iPhone 10, and, and no one owns that. You just see ads online. They do it with cars, they do it with tech, they do it with stuff like that where you can see a glimpse into the future, you can see these prototypes, you can see kind of previews of what's to come. And I I really think the church is a prototype in that same kind of vein. You know, God promises us amazing relational depth. God promises us eternity and community and relationship with him. God promises us so much. He promises that one day he'll come back and his kingdom will be here and in eternity we'll experience this perfect community. Now, the church isn't perfect like that, but the church is a really cool glimpse, a prototype of what's to come. And the more we invest into that, the more we get to see that glimpse of what's coming. And thirdly, I said the church is a team. You know, if you want to, like, get good at hockey and become an NHL star, then, I mean, (laughs) not speaking from experience, but what I understand is that you don't just, like, isolate yourself and just practice by yourself. 
You get coaches, you get trainers, you play with the team, you practice with people, you have people that can spur you on, people that you can uh, compete against, things like that. Church is a great place to come and practice your faith and, and your life together, to journey through the ups and the downs together. Teams, they win together and they lose together. And here, we get that. We go through the wins, we go through the losses of life together. And we can practice, we can encourage each other, and there are people who maybe have a bit more experience in a certain area, and they can speak into your life. If you read the New Testament of the Bible, it is like just full of instructions about how church should run and how it can work well and what, can, what it can accomplish and what its mission is and things that you shouldn't do and things that aren't going well. I mean, it's a giant narrative about the Bible, or about the church. And the church is literally God's hub here on earth that Jesus came a couple thousand years ago and started. It's his hub for his love, the message of his good and amazing love to get out into the world, to inspire us as Christians, to reach other people, to help us grow in our faith. It is such a valuable and important thing. And I believe that this is true about the church all over the world. We're a global community, but we want to talk a little bit. You guys are here at FBC, so in that context of what it means to allow your interaction with FBC, the church community that you're a part of, to help you grow in your relationship with God. Uh, Megan, during her talk, she presented three ideas that uh, she said are, are kind of uh, important in making your faith a priority by thinking big. And I want to look at those th three things this morning. So I believe that you can think bigger, first of all, by attending regularly. Now, it probably seems really self-serving for the guy on the stage who works at the church to say, hey, you guys should go to church really often. You know, that seems really obvious. I want you guys to know, I don't promote church attendance and church involvement because I work at a church. I work at a church because I believe in those things. I work at a church because I have loved the opportunity I've had to experience God's faith and love and goodness through my interactions of being part of a church and thinking big and partnering with the church in its mission. Um, Acts 5.42 is where we get this idea of thinking big and also thinking small, which Doug's gonna be talking about next week. Acts 5.42 says, day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they, the early church, never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Messiah. This idea of think big comes from this idea of them meeting in the temple courts. They didn't really have like a sweet building like we have, you know? They didn't have like a website and an Instagram feed to let you know when cool events are coming up. They just, they just find like a big outdoor area or wherever, and they would gather. Sometimes thousands of them, sometimes 25 of them, whatever, and they would get together and they'd celebrate how good and amazing God is, and they would serve each other, and they would serve what the church was doing there, and as a result, they made a massive impact in the world around them. And they all had the opportunity together in community and in relationship to grow in their faith. Colossians 3.16 says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. The church is a place to learn. And attending regularly gives you more opportunity to learn about God and learn how you can grow closer to him and learn how you can shape your life to reflect his goodness more. And, and I don't just mean like learning from Doug and me, because if that's it, then you might be a little hooped at some points. But I mean, like hopefully you learn something from us at some point. Hopefully your conversations out in the lobby over a donut or a cup of coffee, or, or maybe something we're singing in a song, or maybe just some of your interactions here or in a small group when you join one, or, or as you're serving. We hope that you continue to learn about our amazing and glorious and often mysterious God as we all have opportunities to continue learning about him and how we can pursue him better. I also really believe that attending regularly, showing up, is a really good way to actually physically stake a priority in your faith. And so what I mean is this. We can think something's important, but once you actually physically put it into practice, then it actually becomes a priority and starts to manifest it, so it's like this. I, I've always thought that reading is probably a good idea because smart people read and, uh, you know, that's what I always thought. I was like, they read and they learn stuff. And, and I thought that, but once I started reading, I started actually prioritizing that in my life and setting time aside and it, the benefits became real. Now, I'm not trying to tell you all that you have to become like a bookworm or anything because that's definitely not me. But when you physically prioritize something in your life, it creates a space and makes it a priority. That's for yourself. Beyond that, the faith that the Bible talks about is not about yourself. It's not a selfish thing. It is also about those around you. 
your family, your friends, your kids, the other people here in our FBC community. It's about them. And the ways that you prioritize your faith actually impacts other people. When you prioritize your faith, it gives a good example to other people that maybe they should prioritize, prioritize their faith and their involvement in this community. You know, with your kids, you can tell your kids that, that you are passionate about following God and about and participating in a faith community all you want, but it doesn't matter what you say because they'll look at your actions. They'll see you for, this is like, that's a little scary for me to say because if you don't know, in a couple of months, I'm going to become a dad and I know that, like, you know, I probably tell my daughter a lot of things and she'll be like, no, Ryan, or dad, or whatever she'll call me. Um, she'll, I don't know how it works. Um, she'll say, dad, I can see who you really are. Maybe she won't say it like that and in a few months she probably won't say anything, but she'll know whether it's a priority to me or not. You want your kids your family, to grow up where faith is a priority in their life, show them that it's a priority to you. Model it by showing up regularly. The second thing she talked about that you could think bigger by is serving consistently. I love what Megan said. She said that you, yes, you, have a vital role to play in accomplishing the mission of FPC, in accomplishing the mission of Christ here on earth through his church. God gave you gifts to serve his church. God started the church and he created each and every single person in this room, in this world, uniquely with amazing gifts. He didn't just give you those gifts for fun. He gave you those gifts to serve him and to serve his church and also to serve others. But we're going to get to that in a couple of weeks. I don't want to kind of step on my own toes right now. But right now we're talking about thinking big and God gave you those gifts to serve the church. You have to think about this. You were literally created and put on this planet for the purpose of serving God's faith community, the church. That's a purpose that God created you with. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ we passionately believe here at FBC that one of the best ways to grow in your faith, to grow in your relationship with God, is to take the gifts that he's given you and to put them into action for the purposes that he gave them to you for. You're uniquely created with gifts that only you have. You are the only you, you know? Talisy has identical twin brothers, and even them, like, I mean, at first I didn't know which one was which, so I'd just see which wife went where, and then I could figure it out. But... Even them, over time, I've started to understand that they like, have different names and different personalities and stuff like that. God has created every single person to be exactly who they are. And it's easy to sit back and say, oh, people are taking care of that. People are serving. People are doing that. But they're not you. They're not you doing that. They're them doing that. They're filling a certain important part of, like a piece of the puzzle that they would feel differently than you would. And check this out, this passage says, in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. You've been given gifts to serve so that in all things, God may be praised. One of the most important elements of a faith community is to come together and to praise and worship God and to celebrate how good he is. And we can do that through songs and speech and stuff, but one of the best and most effective ways that God can be praised through what we do is by putting those gifts into action. You can hop on our app, you can hop on our website, there's a little serving tab, you can fill it out, it takes two seconds, it's pretty quick and painless. You don't have to pick an area you want to serve in. Just let us know, hey, I want to start doing some stuff. Maybe you already serve, maybe you want to do some more stuff. Fill it out, come talk to us at the office, whatever. We'd love to have a conversation with you about how you can think bigger by plugging in more. And one thing I love that Megan said is that you can bring something to the table that no one else in this world can contribute. We're excited to talk to you. We're not just excited to talk to someone who can serve, but we're excited to talk to you. I love that Megan said, you know, she started serving and then she started finding new ways to add to serve. And it's not always easy. I feel her. Sunday mornings, yeah, man, like my alarm goes off and I'm just like, dang, like, oh, man, all those lucky non-Christians in the world, you know? It's crazy. I feel her on that. But it is so so worth it. And we'd love to have a conversation with you about what we believe you can bring to the table. And the third thing you can think bigger by is giving generously. Maybe you're thinking, oh man, this is where they go for the big money grab. He's going to get like all, tell some big like emotional story. They're going to bring out like the organ plant. It's going to get really emotional here. They're going to bring out those wooden plates again and try to suck the cash out of us. 
Now, let me tell you, that's not about to happen. It's in a couple months when I have a kid that I'm going to try to suck your money out of you. Um, I'm just kidding. People often think that the church just wants your money. And maybe for some churches in the world, that's true. Here, it's not. Um, God, we believe in a God that wants so much more than your money. He says he wants your heart, your soul, your mind. If you came up to me and you're like, Ryan, you can either give all your money or your heart, your soul, and your mind. I mean, I would assume that the second one probably includes my money as well. I would take the money. It would be way easier and cheaper and, and, and simpler if faith was just about giving money. And it's really not about that. God says he wants you to love him with your heart, your soul, your mind. Every ounce of who you are. The church isn't after your money. God is after all of who you are because he loves you. What he wants from you is way bigger than anything your wallet could ever hold. The Bible is huge on generosity, and this goes way beyond money. We think of generosity, we often just think about money, but you can be generous with your time, your energy, your talents, your gifts, what you can invest into others and contribute to others. And the Bible is all about this. And don't get me wrong, giving money to church and to others in the church and to other people is great. Generosity is great. But I would actually say, if you're new to this faith thing, if you're still figuring it out, I would actually encourage you not even to not feel obligated to give, but to just not give. Don't give money here. Figure out this faith thing. Figure out, do, do I believe that Jesus is real? Do I believe he's who he says he is? Is that something I can line my life up with? Because if so, I believe that as you pursue relationship with him, generosity in your life is just going to start to grow. It, it, it has to. You can't tell me you're pursuing Jesus and not become more generous. And then you can decide if you want to invest into his mission and if you want to be generous in those ways. You will never outgive God. He is so generous. And as his love fills you, that generosity has to fill you. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So I don't know anything about farming or anything like that, so in case you're like me, sow is like planting and reaping is like, like removing from the, like taking the food out of the ground. What, you know? um, so what it's saying is whoever invests or gives, plants generously, will also receive and, and take back and reap the benefits of generously. But if you do it sparingly, you'll also reap sparingly. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, hear me out. Some, some churches and some people maybe on the internet have preached this verse in a bad way where it's some kind of get-rich-quick scheme where, you know, if you give money because of this verse, you're going to get lots of money back. I actually mostly believe the opposite. I mean, if I believe if you give a bunch of your money, you'll have less money. You know, it's kind of like Sally has five oranges. She gives three oranges away. She's not going to have 10. She's going to have two, right? Uh, and that's what I believe. Now, I believe that God is big, and sometimes he does bless people financially, and he meets our needs. But this verse isn't saying, if, if you give your money, God's going to give you a bunch of money back. This is saying, what no eye has seen, we've seen money. What no ear has heard, we've heard of money. God blesses those who love him with their heart, with their soul, with their mind. If you pursue God and be a generous person. He is going to bless you beyond your wildest imagination. I passionately believe that as you engage in a faith community and as you grow in generosity, you will just naturally grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ and vice versa. Practicing generosity to Jesus, who is the most generous man who ever walked the face of the planet, who gave his life for us, it will naturally draw you closer to his heart. Showing up regularly, serving consistently, giving generously, I mean, really, this generosity key brings it all together. Giving your time by showing up. Giving your time, your talents, your energy by serving others. All of it is really what church is all about. 1 John 3.11 says, this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. That means we should be generous to one another. John 13.34-35 says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. It says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Remember, the church should be a prototype. It should be a glimpse into who God is in his perfect relational community with us. And not only for ourselves, but for the world around us. They should be able to look at us and say, those people believe 1 Corinthians 2.9, and I can tell it by the way they live their lives. Not just because they listen to some guy talk about it for 30 minutes, but because their lives are actually changed and transformed by the reality and the promise and the actual real belief that God has prepared unimaginable, unbelievable things for those who love him. 
As you can see here at FBC, we believe that being part of a faith community is vital, vital, necessary for you growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I don't think there's any way around it. I love how Megan pointed to the life-changing experience at the, when she took the leader and training program that inspired her to think big and to change some things in her world. And I hope that during your time here at FBC, that you'll experience moments like that. Maybe it's on a Sunday morning for something we say. Maybe it's during the series. Maybe it's when we're singing, you hear something in a song. Maybe it's in your small group, someone says something. Maybe it's out there in the lobby. Maybe it's something you're reading in the Bible, where it's just one of those aha moments where the light bulb goes on, you're like, yeah, that. Maybe you just see someone in FBC serving and living their life in a way that's so inspiring. They're like, yes, that. that, that I, I need to grow close to Jesus by stepping it up, by turning it up in my life. And I hope that you experience some of those moments. Church isn't an obligation. It's not a religious duty. It's not like a checklist that God's like, yeah, they showed up this Sunday. You know, it's an opportunity. God has offered us all the free gift of relationship with him. And then he offers us beyond that, the free gift of experiencing his love in a faith community rather than in isolation. And it's an amazing gift. And the choice is yours. I'm not talking about the stuff to try to suck you in and give you the hard sell and try to trick you into this and try to coerce you into this. I'm talking about this passionately because I think it's too good to miss. And we're throwing this out there and saying, man, you want to experience God and his goodness? Be a part of his church and his mission. Engage with the church and its mission and you will grow in the way that you engage personally with God. All to the end of having him turn up your significance and purpose and meaning in life that he has created you for. Maybe you've been here for years. Maybe you're new here. We believe that God has amazing things in store for you, no matter where you're at in your faith journey. If you're new here, we believe that the next step to turn it up is to deciding to follow Jesus and have a relationship with him, and we'd love to talk to you more about that. If you've been here forever, we're just encouraging you to turn it up, to not get content and complacent with where you're at, to not say, yeah, I've done enough, but to say, you know what? How can I continue to engage with God personally, and how can I do that through this church that he's created? It is clear to me that God wants to turn up the significance, the purpose, and the meaning in your life, and that that is always his aim in your life. He wants to turn it up to 11. He wants to crank it up way louder than 10 could ever be. But really, the next move is yours. The next move belongs to each and every single person in this room. And the question is, will you take God at his word? Will you take him up on this amazing opportunity that he's freely given to you? Are you willing to think just a little bit bigger? And ultimately... Are you willing to turn it up? Let me pray for you guys. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you that you love us and that you've given us this really cool faith community to be a part of. We're so thankful for what you're doing here at FBC, and I ask that you would continue to change our lives and shape us to look a little bit more like you, to be generous and loving like you are, God. We love you so much. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being here. I hope you have an awesome week, and we'll see you next Sunday.